Okay, thanks, Martha. It's great to be here. I, I've read all about you. Very impressive group. Uh, uh, it's so, so great to have people travel here, with each with your own perspective, and I'm, I'm certainly going to be looking for that, particularly in that uh, half hour, uh, 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 in an hour or so. Um, and uh, you know, I've been very lucky to be here at Penn and uh, had wonderful colleagues like Martha. And then also, I get uh, uh, what I think are the world's best graduate students. I mean, you know. Uh, and uh, one of those uh, is here today, Lorenzo. Uh, and and um, uh, really, a, a good stretch of today's uh, talk uh, is, uh, comes out of my being, having been educated uh, uh, over the last couple of years by Lorenzo and through Lorenzo, some people I'm going to be telling you about. But I'm also going to be talking about data that we've collected and how we've thought about that and some larger issues. But the whole business of medication of sadness, that whole idea of sadness, you'll see is featured quite a bit. And uh, that, uh, uh, the, the way of looking at things in which I'll use the word sadness a lot does uh, really come uh, uh, through Jerry Wakefield and Alan Horwitz, uh, uh, from them through Lorenzo. And we'll, we'll get to that. All right, so, um, you know, I. I, I I grew up in, as, uh, in my clinical psychology training, sort of just as I think psychiatrists wanted to be, um, have legitimacy with the rest of the medical profession, and th that explains quite a lot about what's happened in the development of, of psychiatric diagnosis and treatment over the last 50 years or more. Uh, in a similar kind of way, I think psychologists, like myself, wanted to get legitimacy with psychiatrists and with, in the mental health field. And so I uh, very much swallowed uh, I shouldn't say so. I very much went along with and tried to understand the, uh, the, uh, uh, the field as it was uh, forming itself in the early 80s uh, uh, with the DSM-3 uh, introduction and that whole business. I mean, this is right in the midst of my training. And we were, you know, very serious. These were disorders. These were things that could be identified and, and they were serious and, of course, they still are. Um, and uh, we're just going to learn more and more about these things. We're going to figure them out and we're going to come up with specific treatments because we're going to understand the mechanisms and so on and so on. And it looked like the, that was happening in psychiatry, that they were figuring it out and they were coming up with a mechanism. I'm a bit less, uh, I'm a bit more skeptical about all of that than I was uh, 30 years ago. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, I would say the state of, if you'd asked me what the state of our knowledge then was about mechanisms and stuff, such, uh, in some ways I would, I would have answered you uh, not just more optimistically 30 years ago, but I would have s said that we were pretty well along, and now I don't think we were, as, uh, we're as far along as I thought we were 30 years ago. Anyway, enough of that. So uh, just to, to tell you that we're talking, at least at the beginning, about something that's very serious uh, and something that needs our serious attention uh, as, as a, a problem as opposed to something interesting to try to overcome sadness and so on. Uh, this is not, this, is, this bit here is generally not about sadness, it's about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that we have uh, individuals who are uh, uh, laid quite low uh, by uh, what we can call depressive disorder. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, uh, we know that, that, you know, we studied it, we and others, uh, uh, hmm, oh well, something's happened in the translation, but uh, at any rate, the, uh, uh, we've, we've learned that st stressful life events or losses uh, uh, very often precede these episodes of depression. We understand that there, uh, there certainly must be, uh, even if we've not, if we're not convinced we've identified which ones, there must be genes that predispose people to uh, be vulnerable to certain kinds of environmental inputs. And so there's quite a lot of interest, and I'm sure you've certainly read about these kinds of things. I won't go into the the, uh, the business with the serotonin transporter gene, but that, that, uh, that gene and others have uh, attracted interest. So at any rate, one, one way to look at depression is to think about it, and Martha and I have talked to quite a bit about this and, and other colleagues as well, it's uh, depression as a disorder or as a pathology uh, can, is interesting in that we can think about it as engaging two very different sets of functions uh, which we uh, uh, know or, uh, well, we know uh, are supported in two very different parts of the brain. So we can think of the problems with depression as being something that's dysregulated or something that's uh, not working quite right in the generation of emotion, if you will, um, uh, in the, uh, the sort of uh, 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 triggering of basic drives. Uh, uh, we, we see those as having, happening more in the primitive brain. And then we can also think of depression as something that either we can think of as, as, as 
arising from a dysfunction of executive function or an insufficient or inadequate or inefficient use of executive function to manage life and life and, and emotional things in life. Or we can also think of it uh, uh, in a complementary way as uh, that the, the neocortex can be used with new training, such as, say, cognitive therapy, to uh, address uh, what might be, might be pathologies or disruptions in the limbic brain. And of course, either of these things, at least in principle, even, either of these brain areas, at least in principle, uh, could be affected nicely or, well, just could be affected by medications, by uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Any, any of the kinds of treatments could, could, in principle, address either of those uh, dysfunctions if we, if we think of those as two areas in which we might find dysfunction. Now. Um, you know, I, this is to show you, because uh, we're going to be getting to some stuff later on where we're not talking about depression uh, as profound as this. Uh, this is one uh, kind of extreme. This is a famous person. Uh, uh, I'm going to predict that at least one of you in this room knows, no, you don't count, Martha, yeah, knows who said this. I'm now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful face on earth. Any, any guesses? Yeah, how about that? How many points are we giving, Martha, for uh, Well, wait a minute, you're on the fact, no, no. So you, no points for you. But yes, uh, you're correct. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, I, I ran across this on a visit to Washington a few years back, and I'm not a big note taker, as, as some of my students know, but this one I had to write down. It was on some monument. I forgot to write down where it is. So. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, we know that there are evidence, what I'll call evidence-based somatic treatments. Uh, I don't know how much you all have been talking about this stuff here. I know you've talked some about medicines, but I'm gonna talk about particularly the evidence in regard to depression. Uh, and uh, they really fall into a few different categories. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, is very effective uh, when it's used, uh, very not often used. We can talk about that later if you like. Antidepressant medications. Um, uh, slides seem to have cleared up. That's nice. Uh, uh, antidepressant medications uh, introduced uh, in the 50s, starting with the MAO inhibitors. Um, uh, and then what we've seen have been thought of as advances each time. And of course, you'd hope they would be advances because you shouldn't be doing retreats. But uh, uh, the advance, of course, in the MAOIs was because there are some issues in terms of diet and some, some risk for some, uh, some bad side effects there, particularly in, in interaction with diet. When the tricyclics came along, those were seen as more better tolerated. Uh, when the SSRIs came along, we're gonna talk about, a lot about that, uh, many things changed and, uh, uh, the, um, uh, and, and by many things I mean on the plus and the minus side. And we'll talk about uh, what the effects have been. And then, uh, then the, came the nonspecific uh, 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 reuptic inhibitors, okay, the NSRIs uh, such as Effexor, which the, the big marketing thing there was they were so much better than the SSRIs because they were like this, okay, because they hit both systems and of course when by both we mean serotonin and norepinephrine and now of course people do understand that dopamine systems and other systems are also affected and so on. But I actually went to a talk by a guy I, like, I admire quite a lot who came and said that um, uh, uh, who, uh, Barney Carroll, who uh, uh, came to Penn and gave a grand rounds in which he made it very clear that uh, uh, th 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 these were supposed to be better because uh, they were dirty drugs. And uh, uh, so, at any rate, uh, interesting historical points that we could uh, pursue a bit if you like. Um, so uh, it turns out the, the antidepressant medications, even though really only these are used very much in the U.S. these days, the SSRIs and the NSRIs, it, it, that's largely because those are the ones that are talked about. I mean, there are differences uh, uh, that, that a, a well-educated uh, physician who's using these things will be considering, uh, uh, other than the fact that these are the ones they've heard of and that are kind of popular. And tolerability, so uh, a big, big change that happened with the uh, introduction of Prozac and its, and its neighbors or its, its cousins. Uh, is that patients uh, were not complaining the, the day or two after they started taking the meds or even a week or two after they started taking the meds. Now, uh, and they wouldn't, weren't complaining about dry mouth and you know, uh, dizziness and so on, those blurred vision, the kinds of things that the tricyclics brought about uh, with some regularity. Um, 
And, uh, but they, did, they do start complaining, and those of you who treat patients or see patients know they do, some of them start complaining after a while as they get fatter, or as they find that even though they're maybe feeling better in terms of their depression, they don't wanna have sex uh, uh, with the partner that they, lo that they love. So there are the sexual side effects and, the, and some other things kind of, they're not the things that are noticed immediately, so that's an interesting problem. Um, uh, uh, so, um, but then uh, suicide risk potential is also uh, 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 very different. I mean, this one's controversial. Um, what I would say is that uh, it's certainly the case that you can uh, kill yourself by using tricyclics as the means. It's very, very hard to do with the modern medication. So on that side, uh, that was a big deal, was that you couldn't you know, uh, use your treatment to kill yourself. Uh, that was a big, big uh, uh, advance. Uh, there is, of course, some uh, reason to think that some smallish or small percentage of individuals have very strange and strong reactions to some of the modern medicines, the, 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 the SSRIs and so on, strange and strong. And um, there's some reason to think, although it's a bit of a needle in a haystack problem, some reason to think that, that they can be responsible for some rather extreme behavior uh, that includes suicide, strong suicidal ideology, suicidal uh, thinking, and also homicidal thinking, and possibly even a greater incidence of that. But at the same time, the, they're also, for many other people, reducing depressive symptoms and thereby reducing suicidal thinking. So it's a very tough thing if you will, it's a kind of an epidemiologist's nightmare because, or actually that's what they do, right? They love these kinds of problems. But uh, it, it has these different kinds of uh, things that can be confounding, but certainly enough to, to uh, have us worry. And, and, and some people very strongly are convinced that uh, these medicines have that effect on some individuals, um, and, and especially on uh, adolescents. Okay, so all of these medicines though, as, as, many as, as many differences as there might be, they tend to produce about a 15 to 25 increment in response rates uh, relative to pill placebo. So 60% versus 40% is a, you know, it all depends on which study or which sets of studies where you set your thresholds, but it's not a bad thing to summarize it as 60% uh, respond to the medicine in situations where placebos are also given, where 40% do. Um, but I wanna emphasize that this is in the patient populations on which they generally have been tested, and that'll become important in a few minutes. Okay, so there are also evidence-based uh, psychological treatments for depression. I'm gonna talk, uh, really, to the extent I'm gonna talk about these, I'm gonna talk about cognitive therapy. Uh, it's the one that is the most extensively researched and most, well, maybe most widely practiced. Um, as Martha was mentioning, uh, it compares favorably in its outcomes with antidepressant medications. You'll see these abbreviations throughout, so CT and ADM for cognitive therapy and antidepressant medication. Uh, even, in the more, even in more severe cases of depression. Um, and uh, it's the only treatment that we have that where there's substantial research evidence suggesting that when you stop taking the treatment, you are protected uh, to some extent against relapse once you're done. So that's, we certainly don't have any reason to believe that that would be true in, with medications and there's no evidence to suggest that it does. And there's no other psychological treatment that has that kind of body of evidence. So it makes people interested in this as a, as a treatment. Uh, interpersonal therapy, given time, I'll just, I just want to mention there has been do some research done on it. And then there's the new one, behavioral activation, which was just becoming popular when Tom Insull, the director of the NIMH, decided that we know everything we need to know about treatments for depression, and so we can't study this stuff anymore. So uh, 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 excellent results in two clinical trials, and evidently we're done. So, um, but it's an intriguing, um, uh, treatment that, to some eyes, appears simpler than the cognitive therapy does and therefore possibly easier to disseminate, but that's all sort of what seems to be possibly so, rather than anything that anyone's tested. You might detect that we tried to submit a grant on this question and were denied, we were not allowed to submit the grant. So um, after doing the work that you'll see in a minute. Here are just some, some facts about how uh, antidepressant medications are, are being used today. This is, these data are now you know, five plus years old, but uh, they're, they're probably quite representative of, of what's going on now. So if you t take uh, teenagers on up, 11% uh, of Americans are on antidepressant medications. You probably have seen these figures by now. Um, uh, uh, they, the, among those, if you survey all the people without symptoms for depression, 8% of them will be on uh, antidepressants. Now, of course, some of those would, might tell you, and maybe even correctly, that the reason they don't have symptoms is because they're on antidepressants. 19% uh, uh, of those around with mild symptoms are on them. 28% uh, 
uh, moderate, 33% severe. So, um, you know, there is a lot of this is being used, and we don't really know uh, in, 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 a, in the kind of sense that we would like to know how useful these things are f for people. So, obviously, um, if, uh, if you find people who, are in severe, who have severe symptoms, 33% of our medications, you might say, good, they need to be on them. Um, but then they still have severe symptoms, and, and so I'm not giving you any definitive answers here. I'm just saying that this is a, uh, a, a, a common uh, treatment that we don't think very much, uh, I don't think we think very carefully about as I'll keep, uh, as I'll be talking about uh, uh, as we continue. Um, of all those on uh, antidepressant medications, 60% uh, of them, which would be 7% of the population, have been on them for two or more years. 14% um, of them have uh, uh, been on them for 10 or more years, so can pretty, you know, chronic use. And uh, less than a third of those on a single antidepressant medication, so let's finish the sentence, less than a third of those on a single medication have seen a mental health professional in the past year, and less than half of those on two or more antidepressants, so polypharmacy, less than half of those individuals have seen a mental health professional in the past year. This is in the U.S. Um, uh, they're being used, as you probably know, for lots of things, for good or ill, uh, for premenstrual tension, for sleep disturbances, migraines, feeling tired. So uh, national trends, these, are, these data are a bit old now, but, but it, they, they illustrate a point really that continues, namely uh, that uh, about those, um, among those people diagnosed with depression, the um, uh, antidepressant use increased, and it really did make a huge increase in this period. 35% uh, uh, were being treated with antidepressants in 87, as, as Prozac and so on was starting to be known and popularized, and by 97, uh, more than double uh, uh, that. Uh, of, again, of those with depression, that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's, that's, uh, uh, that still is a good question. Psychotherapy at the same time, though, was, um, uh, being, uh, was on a decline in terms of its use for people with depression. So it became, uh, you might say this is a reading that says that in, the pop, in, the, in our population and, and among health professionals, uh, the belief in that period was antidepressant medications good, psychotherapy not so good, um, and, uh, or, or certainly not a, a, as useful. And the, again, the trend just widens a bit, but that's where the knee and the curve occurred. So the reasons for the trends over time, and this is kind of, uh, this is where it gets, I think, a little bit more interesting. Um, so I, I, I alluded to the fact that the uh, SSRIs, that they're safe to give. Uh, uh, primary care providers can give them without fear that they're, well, with a tiny bit of fear, that their patient will go home and kill themselves. They won't kill themselves with the SSRIs, but there is this uh, concern about uh, inducing that kind of thinking. But at any rate, uh, patients don't complain about them much relative to the other medications. The federal government, in, 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 in partnership uh, with uh, the National Association of Mentally Ill, um, uh, it really went, decided this was an important public health problem, which it, it is, and uh, embarked on a public health campaign to educate the public about depression. A lot of this was destigmatizing depression, which I think is generally a good thing. I think there are some not so good things that happen in the midst of that. And, and you may know what I mean. We'll get to that later, too. Um, promotion of sales through vigorous advertising campaigns to primary care doctors and to consumers. We all, at least those of you who are in the United States know that, that it's very hard to go a day without, uh, actually you can do it, right? You just don't watch TV, don't listen to radio. Yeah, you, you can get a day without Keep seeing these ads. Uh, Keep your pop-up, yeah, that's right. Get a good pop-up blocker. So um, at any rate, uh, these, these, these campaigns certainly were effective. And uh, the growth of managed care, uh, uh, and these, by the way, these are Olfson's conclusions. I've got some uh, things to add to this, but uh, growth of managed care resulted in shifts from specialty to primary care medical management. So um, psychotherapy, I, th I think I heard, Anjan, you were talking a little bit about how hard it is. I mean, there are all kinds of issues, including, like, who am I going to refer this person to, even if I think it's a good idea? And will they show up? If I do refer them, that's another problem. But psychotherapy certainly uh, uh, is reimbursed less generously than medication treatment. And primary care physicians, for a variety of reasons, uh, of course, are using uh, medications. Lorenzo and I are partnering with a colleague here at Penn to study the, the beliefs and practices of prim primary care providers. And in discussion, some of that, those data might come up. Okay, so 
80% of prescriptions are made, of antidepressants, are made by physicians who are not psychiatrists, okay? So in other words, uh, in, in 62%, most of those, in other words, most of the, uh, those who aren't psychiatrists are primary care providers. And uh, antidepressants are increasingly being prescribed for not just un undiagnosed as, to, as in not yet diagnosed conditions, but in conditions that would not meet criterion for certainly major depressive disorder, but uh, a, a good chunk of those would not meet criterion for any mental disorder. But again, we mentioned fatigue, sleep, and other kinds of reasons people are being prescribed these medicines. Um, so again, primary care providers, very important in all of this. Uh, they treat uh, at least half of the depression cases. Uh, uh, a lot of people in primary care who go to see their doctors, there's, a, there's of course a bias to, for people to go to, to doctors when they're not feeling well in general, they're having health issues, and, they're, and they may, uh, very often they will also, if asked, or even if not asked, will uh, describe a, a condition that uh, could meet criterion for depression. And uh, most uh, people when you, in this country, when you survey them, when you ask where would you like to go with the mental health problem, they'd say, I want to go to my, my doctor, meaning my primary care doctor. They don't want to go to some shrink. They don't want to go to, you know, some, some psychotherapist. They, you know, they want to go to their doctor. Uh, okay. Americans' attitudes, it kind of goes along the same way. This, this is just, again, a, a trend uh, uh, that, uh, where the knee and the curve was right around uh, the, the turn of the millennium. Uh, so we see 98 to 2006, you see that uh, an increase in the percentage of patients, although already pretty high, that, that think medications can help people feel better about themselves. That's the way it's worded. Um, help me deal with day-to-day -day stresses, okay? A medicine that helps me. So now we're talking, I think, enhancement. Was, when you frame it that way, help me deal with day-to-day -day stresses. That sounds like enhancement to me. Uh, a, a kind of a negative spin on enhancement, I guess. It's, uh, but still. And then uh, 47 would take medications to cope with life stresses. And that's a, a little bit different, right? It's a little different frame because they're implied as maybe a big stress uh, as opposed to the middle one where uh, uh, people are saying, yeah, they can help with day-to-day -day stresses. Um, again, none of this is good or bad, and that you folks wouldn't be here if you weren't of a mind to be able to think about things that is not black and white, not good or bad. And I'm, I'm not going to try to push you into thinking black or white, except on a couple of things, of course. Uh, so, um, so why has uh, a psychotherapy, uh, the use of psychotherapy reduced over time? Um, uh, particularly since awareness is bigger and so on about pro mental health problems. So there really hasn't been public education about the effectiveness of psychotherapies. You don't see ads for these things. And these, these uh, uh, advocacy groups, National uh, Alliance for the Mentally Ill and so on, they tend to be people who are very much involved with very severe mental illness, but also they're getting funding from the pharmaceutical industry. That's, I mean, they've got to get funding somewhere to get their message out. So they've partnered with them and we know what can happen even when we're not looking or not paying attention when, when we partner with someone. Um, uh, no, even if everyone has good intentions. Uh, lack of availability, this is what Anjan was uh, at least in part referencing, if I heard correctly in the hallway. Uh, so there really just aren't people trained up to do this kind of, to do an evidence-based psychotherapy. Um, there is a persistence of the belief that psychotherapy is more expensive than medication, it's, and, and we can talk about, I mean, I, I think it's certainly not a given that that's true, and in fact, I'll show you some data that suggests that it's absolutely not true, or that the, the opposite is so, uh, at least under certain uh, assumptions. And then consumer demand for antidepressants is just, I mean, again, uh, patients come in and uh, uh, they, they expect to be treated with antidepressants. Uh, antidepressants. They know that if they get a prescription, they can go down and fill it, and uh, they'll pay two bucks or five bucks or whatever the copay is. That's pretty good. That doesn't mean that that's the cost of the medication. That means what's coming out of their pocket at that moment. Um, and of course, when I, I meant more than I just meant to say, which is it's coming out of their pocket at that moment. Then it's going to come out of their pocket a few months from now and a few months from now, and a few months, you know, so 10 plus years of a few bucks out of your pocket, even the co-pays add up, but certainly the, the retail cost is, uh, is quite high, can be. Uh, and also, and this is, you know, uh, uh, consumers are thinking, well, wait a minute, so I can go to the pharmacy once, uh, or maybe go for refills, and, uh, and pay something, or I can show up once a week for 10, 20 weeks, 
uh, go to somebody's office downtown. You know, uh, it takes time. It takes, uh, I've got to arrange to, who's going to watch the kids and that kind of thing. And they're going to make me talk about stuff that I don't, I'm not even good talking about with my husband or wife, much less some stranger. All right. Okay. So, um, have the shifts in treatment practices yielded greater benefits? The increase in treatment generally, and particularly the uh, uh, increase in the use of antidepressants. Well, uh, by all accounts, uh, the rates of depression and the chronicity of depression and the disability from depression all continue to rise. We could debate uh, uh, the, 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 the data there. They're, they're, it's very hard to get data that are as clean as a whistle on any of this. Uh, uh, over time, but, but certainly all, all things point to that, to those facts. Um, uh, relapse rates uh, on the most common treatments are as high as 50 to 80 percent, so that's not a, a, a great uh, selling point. Um, lifelong treatment is recommended for patients with recurrent depression, so you know, if you're going to be in treatment for the rest of your life, uh, all kinds of issues there, aside from the high cost, of course, there's the, uh, uh, anything that develops over time medically from those you have to worry about. Uh, patients often, this, this is a point that's, uh, I, I, I went like this uh, many times, smacked myself in the head when I read uh, uh, Robert Whitaker's excellent book um, that I'll uh, uh, reference a bit later on, um, that clinical trials are, are set up this way too. So patients who go off their medicines, uh, if they're on antidepressants, learn that the medicine was good right, because they start to feel really bad. So, you, you know, you think that, that, that that's the, uh, a reasonable inference. And moreover, compared to people, uh, uh, so if you go on to placebo, the same thing happens relative to if you stay on medication. So people who are taken off their placebos uh, do worse in the period of time that they're being watched, typically, uh, than the people who stay on their medicines. Well, that would seem to show that the medicines were doing their job, and it might, and it might even for some subsets and so on. But what it could also show, and what we know that to some extent it must also show, is that the people who are being taken off, off their medicines are feeling worse because they're being taken off their medicines, because they're uh, having what, what's called a discontinuation syndrome. The, the, I've been in uh, pharmaceutical reps talks where this, uh, the, someone jokingly mentioned withdrawal effects. Oh, no, 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 it's not withdrawal, it's discontinuation. It's a big distinction there. So uh, the discontinuation syndrome, and for some of the more modern medicines, you may know this, the discontinuation syndrome can be extremely unpleasant for some individuals, uh, and, and it usually isn't a, a whole lot of fun. So why haven't we developed? Why, why are we here? Why are we uh, 50 years in, after these great discoveries in the 50s of these medicines that clearly have an effect on something that we care about, the, the MAOIs and then the TCAs and so on, why, why are all these things true 50 years later? Why not uh, more advanced? Well, there are many ways to answer that question. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the answers is that uh, uh, clinical trials focus on a certain thing. And I mentioned before that some of us have followed the pharmaceutical industry and the design of our psychotherapy trials, and you'll see that here. But uh, we were actually, f uh, uh, I don't want to say forced, that seems too strong. We were strong-armed, that's better, into uh, doing our trial on only the more severely depressed patients. Our, our big trial that we did around the turn of the century or, uh, that we published in 2005, I'll show you data from. Um, the idea was, no, 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 the, the people of greatest interest are those with high severity symptoms. Those, that's real depression, and there's a point to that. Um, but it turns out that there are lots of points to that, and one of those is that the, that is the group that had been studied by, in the pharmaceutical trials because it was understood that that was the group that was most likely to reveal a difference between the medicines and the control treatment. And there might be other good reasons to study the more severely depressed patients, and they're the reasons we were willing to alter our, our own research in order to focus on these more severe cases. Um, but What's happened, of course, in the interim is that most of the people who get treated for depression are not in this group. And so we have kind of don't know very much about the group who are getting uh, uh, most of the treatment. Okay, this is just a slide to show you. This is uh, 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 Martha referenced some work that we've done. Uh, this was, uh, uh, this is an update of a, what we call a mega-analysis, or we can just call it a mega-meta-analysis in polite company, but uh, uh, this is, uh, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. We were quite surprised that the uh, 
that journal would, uh, would take this paper, but they did. And, and the bottom line was that um, everyone in the field was talking about these 53 patients uh, who produced in this study uh, that was published in the, in the uh, uh, early 90s. Uh, these 53 patients who produced this result, which was that a, a, in the su ha subset of patients in this study who got either co randomized to cognitive therapy or antidepressant medications, uh, the ones in cognitive therapy didn't do very well. This is higher as worse, uh, uh, worse scores than the Hamilton uh, depression scale. And the ones who uh, got antidepressant medications, uh, you know, did better than that. Okay, so we, th we said to ourselves, well, there are other data that people haven't looked at in this way of dividing into more severe and less severe. And when we did that, we find, and we continue to find, I mean, this is just a, this seems to just be so, that when you compare even in this more severely depressed half, if you will, or of the population of depressed people, uh, you just pretty much find in the short run that these two treatments, antidepressant medications and cognitive therapy, are about equally uh, likely or equally effective to, in reducing symptoms. Uh, Martha referenced that there might be some advantages, and I actually uh, said something about this a few minutes ago, too. This is from that, uh, a study that we did uh, that um, uh, assigned people randomly to cognitive therapy versus medications. Um, and then at the end of the 16-week treatment, only those who had responded to cognitive therapy and medication, it turned out it was a 58% response rate in each case. Uh, we then tracked them over the next two years. This, is, this shows the first year of data. And over the first year, those who had been on medications were um, randomly assigned to either stay on their medication, that's the red group, or to uh, come off onto placebo, that's the yellow. And uh, uh, these are the people in cognitive therapy who, the blue ones, who uh, were uh, then uh, uh, could see, they basically were finished with therapy. They could have three booster sessions in their year if they wanted. Well, what you can see is, and these are relapses, so it's a survival curve. and. Uh, uh, cognitive therapy patients were protected, certainly uh, uh, relative to those with short-term uh, medications, namely put onto placebo, um, and uh, at least numerically uh, superior, not statistically significantly so, uh, relative to those who stayed on their medications. And this is just um, a summary of that uh, in a way, which is uh, something we should care more about, isn't how many people get better. Uh, and if you only care about relapses, then you've left the how many people get better behind. And so this just co collapses those two indicators, the getting better and the staying better, into one index. And uh, so this is the, uh, uh, we're still not doing great, uh, but what we're certainly seeing here is not doing great with short-term medications, uh, a bit better with medications sustained for 16 months, and a bit better yet with cognitive therapy, but cognitive therapy happening uh, pretty much in the first uh, four months. Um, this is just uh, one analysis of cost, and it's just, uh, at this point, it's schematic. It's an older slide. That, uh, these uh, are in euros or something. No, I don't know what they're in. No, they're in dollars, but in, uh, not in 2013 dollars. And basically, the point is that, uh, and these, these are actually drawn from data at the time, that the medication costs, uh, if you keep people on medication, keep rising. And at a certain point, and in, in our data, uh, that point was crossed 12 months into treatment. The uh, cost of the medicine uh, provision actually uh, begins to exceed the cost of the cognitive therapy. And this, again, was in the context of cognitive therapy doing at least as well in uh, treating the, the symptoms and keeping them away. So again, I, I guess I asked the question, this phrase, I used this phrase earlier, how do we get here? So in the 50s, there was a great excitement about the prospect of understanding and, and treating severe or real depression by identifying and altering crucial, but I think we, we always thought would be simple, brain mechanisms. Um, Destigmatization, I, I mentioned. Uh, expansion of the definition of depression. We're gonna have a look at that now. And, uh, and the introduction of Prozac, and then uh, promotion of antidepressant medication. So I guess we've really covered those things. Um, but here's what people who take antidepressant medications will tell you, and th they believe it, and we, I can't tell them that they're wrong. I shouldn't tell them that they're wrong. Um, uh, first of all, uh, people who take antidepressants will say, it was great, it helped me throw my depression. I have no doubt that for, if we could somehow run the experiment, put the time machine, you know, the, uh, run a parallel universe, for many, many people, that is just absolutely so. Um, uh, uh, there are other positive effects that these medicines have. 
uh, on people that they'll, they'll talk about and they don't really care. I mean, uh, uh, somebody who's taking medicine doesn't really care if their depression score is going down. They, they, they care about whether they like the way they feel more. And it might not be that their depression score is going down. It might be other things. We have some data on that too. Um, there certainly are placebo effects that the person who's telling you about this has no idea uh, how much it might be affecting him or her, but we know that they are there in general, uh, uh, in, in the aggregate. And then, of course, there is this discontinuation effect. So people say, oh, no, 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 but I know my depression, I need my antidepressant because when I started to go off it, I felt awful. Therefore, I, I, I'm a person who's better with it. Well, we don't know that you would have felt awful this month if you'd never started taking it. I mean, that's, in, uh, that's the point. Um, so, um, so treatment of depression moved to primary care uh, providers and patient demand increased. And uh, then somebody said, or two guys actually, said, wait a minute, <laughs> let's take a step back and ask ourselves what we're doing. So I, I cannot recommend this book too highly. That's, that's a proper phrase, I think. That, you can twist that one, but uh, you know what I mean. I really recommend this book. Uh, and it is the book uh, uh, called The Loss of Sadness. How many of you have either, how many of you have seen this book or know about its exist existence? Okay, so uh, Loss of Sadness, um, How Psychiatry Transformed nor Normal Sorrow into Depressive Disorder. And what's so impressive about these two guys is that every time you think that you're gonna say, oh, well, they're oversimplifying or that, you know, no, this is not oversimplified, this is uh, I, I will try to convince you of that, or at least try to convince you to look further into it and to find out for yourselves uh, that this is not an oversimplification. Uh, in, in, and to get to a bit to the punchline, they're not talking about we shouldn't treat people, they're not talking about that there isn't real depression, and so on. They're talking about something else. So what they want to emphasize is that sadness is a universal emotion that's cross-cultural, present in animals. So it's, it's, it, seems, it seems, I mean, you can't quite argue from this, but it does seem that, they're, that we're kind of built to have at least sadness. Uh, they're, 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 there's, uh, as, as it were, well, maybe not no getting around it. Maybe there's some enhancing drug that makes it so we never need to be sad. But at any rate, it's been around for a long time. Um, uh, there are certainly, we can certainly think in terms of a, a, a loss response as having uh, uh, some functions. I mean, we don't need to get into an evolutionary uh, psychology discussion. We can later if we want. But uh, there are all kinds of reasons to think that there are mechanisms that we have built in that m probably most of the time do very little harm and maybe are, uh, uh, actually show that we're uh, a proper member of the species, that our, that our organs, including this one, are working the way they're, they're actually, uh, uh, if you will, supposed to. Certainly sadness does have biological correlates. Um, uh, we, we can, you, you can uh, get people, you, people don't have to be depressed in order to find uh, cortisol and other kinds of uh, uh, indexes that would say that uh, 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 sadness involves the body, the brain. And uh, sadness tends to remit with the law, uh, recovery of loss of the passage of time. So what's major depressive disorder? Well, it's long been recognized in its infliction. It's a terrific history in this book that shows how depression has been thought about. I, I've taught about depression for 30 years, and there are many, many things in this book that I've never gotten around to reading about in terms of the history of thinking on depression. Uh, Cross-cultural, just over and over again, uh, uh, they, in cultures there is a recognition that there is an affliction. There is a, a serious problem that we uh, that called melancholia, depression, or whatever. Um, and uh, it, as it happens, though, major depression and this I've known for a long time, uh, m almost, uh, well, not 85%, there's the number, usually happens in reaction to a stressor, but it's seen as dysfunctional, okay? So a, 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 what, what they would, uh, uh, Horowitz and Wakefield would say is uh, that when we want to use a, a disorder language, um, uh, it, it's okay, it can often occur in the response to a stressor, but the key is that it's a dysfunctional response to the stressor, not an expected, expectable, understandable one. Again, we know depression has biological correlates, and we know it can spontaneously remit. So it's a, it's a subtle matter to be thinking about, um, to be thinking about uh, uh, this distinction, but uh, it's going to get a bit less subtle in a few minutes. So uh, according to dsm 4 uh, the periods of sadness are inherent aspects of the human experience. These should not be diagnosed as major depressive disorder 
criteria, uh, in, uh, major depressive disorder, unless criteria are met for severity, duration, distress, or impairment. Well, yeah, except that once you get these, you're going to get this. I mean, this, that's, the, 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 depression is about distress. So uh, if you have some symptoms, so this is, a non, this is not a useful criterion. It, it, people are distressed. They're in distress. Uh, the, but it, the point being that this dis, uh, distracts us for whether that distress or, or even impairment is something that we need to or should, uh, whether it's useful to think about it as pathological as opposed to something that, that uh, is distinct from the pathological. Okay. Well, how many of you have heard of Robert Spitzer? Okay, so Spitzer was the primary architect, uh, uh, leader in the development of the DSM-3, and, uh, uh, and he seemed, you know, what he laid out in the logic for that seemed compelling at the time, so I'm not going to second guess it. Uh, it. It was how I was trained. It made good sense. Um, he wrote the, the foreword, a lengthy foreword to this book, um, in which, oh, this is the Robert Spitzer, and I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, I'm sure you guys know this, but this is the Robert Spitzer who uh, uh, had to retreat from his position on homosexuality as a, a disorder, right? So he, he has done this before, and I actually I, I respect him for be, the willingness to retreat. It's always better to be right the first time, but better to be right eventually. So uh, he wrote a, a, a lengthy uh, uh, preface to the book. The DSM is not consistent even in applying its own definition of mental disorder to the diagnostic criteria sets specific, for specific disorders. We'll see what that is in a minute. So, all right. So, uh, the, the, what's, what does the loss of sadness mean? It means, of course, the loss of our ability to appreciate that sadness is a thing is a, uh, on its own is, it, and is okay and is, is normal, as it were. It's an adaptive loss response, we can think, uh, say. Um, Whereas major depression should involve a dysfunction of the normal loss responses. Or, in some cases, as you know, depression, it doesn't even appear to be in reaction to a loss at all. It just looks like a loss response, but it may occur, uh, if you will, uh, seemingly at least at, out of the blue. Symptoms of major depressive uh, disorder uh, can occur uh, in this way of thinking about it. The symptoms can occur uh, uh, in response to a life stressor uh, uh, without being indicative indicative of dysfunction, in fact, might indicate function. And by ignoring the context in which symptoms occur, DSM confuses sadness with um, major depressive disorder. So this is just a case that's from the book, uh, uh, and, and let's, I'll read it because we're all here. So a 64-year-old married man has developed feelings of sadness and emptiness, lack of pleasure and activities, insomnia, fatigue and lack of energy, and feelings of worthlessness. So there you have it, the depressive symptoms. He's not interested in seeing friends and seems unable to concentrate on anything. He yells at his wife when she attempts to console him and rejects her efforts to comfort him. I mean, th this is certainly painful, distressing, uh, 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 and, and disabling or you know, uh, dysfunction. He's, he's not getting along with his wife. Um, he's not seeing his friends. So this is a problem. Everyone would see this. This is not good in some sense, okay? Well, uh, uh, now we can uh, consider that the feelings were triggered two weeks before when the company the man worked for unexpectedly fired him as part of a corporate downsizing just six months before he would have qualified for the company's retirement plan. Uh, one of the ma major reasons the man chose to work for the company and then spend two decades with it had been the prospect of generous retirement benefits. The loss of these benefits means that he and his wife will have very little retirement income other than Social Security. So, you know, it's not just that he lost the job and so on. You can imagine, I mean, it, it, in fact, what I like to do is to think of the opposite. I like to think of a person to whom this would happen, and they go, and they say, well, you know, that's life. And that, it's, I mean, that, that's, an, that's a response to this, but I'm not sure we would all say it is the one and only best response to this. I mean, here is, a, a certainly, we, we, uh, I hope you would forgive me if this happened to me. And I said, oh my God, I can't believe I did all this planning. What an idiot I was to do all this planning based on all these assumptions that were, you know. So this is what's happening to this guy in the, in the aftermath of this. So, subsequently, the couple is forced to sell their house and move to a small apartment. The man finds part-time work that, along with Social Security, provides barely enough resources to sustain him and his wife. So, the, the problems sort of persist. I mean, a bulk of them do. He remains bitter about how he is treated, but his symptoms gradually subside over time. Now, 
in one way of thinking about this, this, per, this guy went through a major depressive illness episode, okay? And then there's the other way of thinking about this, which is that his brain, mind, person worked in the way that people's brains, minds, and persons do. And uh, it, 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 to, to call this dis, uh, disorder would be a disservice or, or has, uh, creates problems. So, um, so the proposal from the loss of sadness is that the, uh, and it, it, we have someone who has sadness, the context is specific uh, to losses. Uh, it's proportional, and, and this is the important thing. You want to pay attention to the uh, uh, conjunctions and uh, disjunctions here. So uh, uh, proportional in intensity and duration, okay? So that implies if it's not proportional, okay? Uh, and it wanes with time and changes in circum uh, and with changes in circumstances and changes uh, 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 in internal coping. Major depression, in this way of thinking about things, uh, occurs out of the blue, or at least, well, occurs out of the blue, or is disproportionate in intensity and duration in cognitive and affective ways, or persists despite changes in circumstances of the passage of time. So, for example, in the case we just looked at, the one case we, we, we read, uh, if that individual, in that new context in which he was doing okay, if he continued to have major depressive disorder symptomatology, even in this way of thinking about things, we might say, yes, the person has now developed a major depressive disorder. We now can say, because the, the reaction was disproportionate in time and, and, uh, uh, and relative to circumstances. That, would have, that one might be a tough call, but it would depend on how well the, the, he was getting along, whether uh, uh, he was able to at least pay the rent and so on, but that's the assumption. So uh, I don't know how many of you uh, uh, have spent much time thinking about uh, uh, classification of depression. I used to think about it a lot and uh, actually still do. Uh, and there's uh, lots and lots of work on trying to, to find subcategories of depression that carve it up because depression is, is heterogeneous even before Horowitz and Wakefield. And uh, endogenous versus reactive is a big one. But um, this is not that revisited. There's a different assumption about the role uh, of life events. So uh, in the old system, the people were trying to have, make sure everything lined up. So endogenous meant no life events triggered it. It meant uh, certain sets of symptoms, including waking up too early rather than uh, having trouble going to sleep, for example, not eating rather than eating too much. So there were all these desires to have uh, core symptoms, uh, 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 triggers and so on line up in a particular way. And this, the way I'm talking about here and that you can read more about with the book, uh, doesn't make all of those assumptions. Uh, and I think that's only, uh, to my reading, it's only a good thing. It's nice to have these two streams that are different in every way, but that's probably not how it works. Um, and also, there was a, uh, an assumption about uh, treatment response that if you have a real depression, an endogenous one, you're going to uh, uh, respond very well to medications, and if you don't, you won't. And if you have a reactive uh, uh, condition, you're going to respond to, let's say, psychotherapy, and if you don't, you won't. Well, none of that has panned out, and it's not surprising that it would. And I'll just say one thing about that. There's nothing in this way of thinking about things that would say that even uh, if the guy, they didn't make that phone call and someone gave him a medication, there's nothing in that that says he won't start to feel better, right? Uh, he could feel better, and again, you all can think of it in terms of enhancement kinds of thinking if you want. So um, uh, there's, there really is, it would be nice if it all lined up, sort of nice, uh, be simple anyway, but uh, no, no need for it to do so if we want to understand how humans function and how to make, help, help them function better. Um, so there are many reasons to, to think that it's, that it'd be important to get it right. Uh, obviously, it's tough to figure out the neuroscience of depression if you're studying depression in something that's not. Um, it's tough to, by the same logic, it's tough to f uh, figure out the etiology, genetics, or any other kinds of an etiology about a disorder if you're studying, if you're putting this fellow in, assuming certain things about this fellow, along with individuals who have these courses of depression where they simply are having uh, dysfunctional reactions to things. Uh, obviously, uh, it leads to uh, what can be unnecessary treatment, and we find, uh, and we get misestimates of prevalence rates. Now, I guess we're, we're, I guess my, my talking time is basically up. I want to mention something that I'm sure you've all read about and thought about, and that is the bereavement exclusion. 
Um, and uh, Jer Jerry Wakefield, uh, one of the authors of the book, has been very involved in, in uh, discussions, shall we say, with uh, uh, those at the DSM-5. And um, uh, to, to just give a, a bit of background, the, um, uh, the idea is that uh, in, in the last 30 years, if you had all the symptoms of depression, uh, but it was understood that, and in, they lasted for two weeks, it was understood that you had lost a loved one, your spouse, in the previous six months. They've changed the time frame at various times, but let's say six months. Uh, you would not be given the diagnosis of major depressive disorder you, because it would be excluded for bereavement. And there, so that, that could be a useful way to do things, um, but there are two very different ways of doing it than that. The one way that the DSM has gone most recently is to say, wait a minute, there's nothing special about bereavement. If you're depressed, you're depressed. We have to take that seriously. If you're not, you know, if you've got all the symptoms, there's, uh, it, you, are, you have major depressive disorder. That's one way. And you could say, well, the, the fight would be between those who want to save bereavement as an exclusion versus those who want to say, no, 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 it's nothing special. Well, Jerry Wakefield is over here. He's saying there never was anything special about bereavement, but there is something special about having losses and things that people react normally with sadness and so on too. So there, the, and to just to keep it short and you'll know what I mean, uh, the, the recommendation is that there be a loss in expectable circumstance, you know, d d sadness in the, f in the face of expectable circumstances exclusion, which would capture a, a whole lot more individuals, including, by the way, and this, uh, we'll, we'll cut it off here, including many individuals whom already mental health professionals are be giving the bereavement exclusion to, even though they're not in bereavement. It's just that the, the mental health professional will write down this bereavement, even if the person was fired, or a person, you know, a dog died, or uh, which for many, of course, is even worse than a spouse dying, um, uh, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and so, so that's where things are. But the, the, you've, you've, you know, you've read about it in the news, all the DSM-5 uh, stuff. Uh, but in the depression world, this is the one that's, that uh, has taken up uh, the, the attention. And it really, unfortunately, in the news, this kind of discussion, I don't think has been featured much. So it really has been, should bereavement be excluded or not, as opposed to, should we be thinking about the fact that people uh, can be sad and, 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 and think about that differently than that they have a, an illness disorder, what have you. So. Um, there, there is uh, uh, plenty to discuss, and I think that's. Uh, but I think there's plenty that I've already shown you that that uh, should lead to some discussion. So I'll stop right there and uh, uh, look forward to learning from you.